Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for turning out on this somewhat misty, gloomy Saturday morning. Um, we're delighted to have all of you who are here in person at the Journalism School, and I would also like to welcome everybody who is participating as a part of our live stream audience. Um, the program today is um, going to be to introduce you to the Journalism School, to the programs that we offer, and um, to take as many questions as you have, both from the people who are here in person as well as the people from the live stream audience. My name is Christine Souders. I am the Associate Dean for Admission and Financial Aid. Um, I read many of your applications. <laughs> Um, and certainly discuss them all in the admission committees. Um, so I am just delighted to welcome all of you here. Um, I'm just going to, just so I can get a quick idea of who is in the audience and what you might be interested in, tell me how many of you are from New York. Just raise your hands. Okay. And how many from outside of New York? And how many of you from other countries? Okay got a very U.S. audience today. Um, how many of you are still in undergraduate school? Great. And how many of you are practicing journalists? Terrific. And how many of you are interested in the full-time MS program? Got it. And the part-time MS program? Okay, great. And the Master of Arts program? Terrific. Okay, super. Well, we have a group of faculty and another panel of students who will be here to talk with you about our programs, about their, the students will be talking also about their experiences here at the Journalism School. Um, my colleague, Taryn Almanzar, who, Taryn, if you want to just wave for a minute, Taryn Almanzar, who is our Assistant Dean for Admission and Financial Aid, is um, going to be um, speaking also about financial aid and scholarships, very important topic. Um, I'd also like to point out David Hooker in the back. Many of you have either corresponded or spoken with David. Um, David runs our office, and we can't survive without him. Um, and he's also running the live stream, so um, he's running the chat on the live stream for those of you who are participating uh, via the, the live stream. And um, Gina Bubion from the Career Services Office will also be here shortly. Um, so because I know that one of the big questions that we always get is, yeah, and so I want to be a journalist, but I'm really concerned about getting a job. And Gina is going to talk with you about that as well. I'm just going to run very briefly through the programs that we offer, and then I'm going to turn things over to our faculty who are the experts on the programs. Um, we do have a Master of Science program, which is designed for people who are at the beginning of a career in journalism. People might be coming directly from undergraduate school. They might be coming from an entirely different career. Um, and they might be people who have been in the journalism business for a couple of years, maybe three, four years, but who have recognized that there is additional training that would be very helpful to them um, as they move along in their careers. The MA program is designed for journalists who are practicing professional journalists already and who have starting maybe three to about 20 years of journalism experience. And this is a program that's designed for people who want to go deeper into their journalism, who want to learn how to do more nuanced reporting and writing, to really dive deeper into the kind of journalism that they're doing, but who are also looking to specialize in an academic content area in their reporting. We have four content areas or concentrations, and they include arts and culture, journalism, business and economics reporting, um, politics and global affairs reporting, and the fourth is science, technology, environmental journalism. So those are some opportunities there. Um, 
the MS program offers opportunities both in a general multimedia program, but also in investigative journalism, and there is also a specialization in documentary filmmaking. So there are quite a few things there. And in addition, we have a data journalism program. It's brand new. The first cohort started in May. And this is for, it's a 12-month program that is designed for people who really want to be able to use data in the journalism that they do. Um, and so we'll be talking a little bit about all of these programs. Um, and I also just realized, I didn't ask, is there anybody here for the doctoral program in communications? Okay, you and I will talk a little bit separately then, okay? There is also a doctoral program in communications. It is an interdisciplinary program that we offer. Um, and it is designed for people who want to go into teaching and research. Um, so I mentioned that specifically teaching and research. It is not designed for people who want training in journalism, um, just in case anybody had a question about that. Uh, I'm going to turn things over now to our faculty members. And I'm going to ask Betsy West um, to start. Betsy is going to talk about the full-time MS program. Um, and she also works in the documentary specialization. She works with video. So she's going to talk a little bit about all of those things. Betsy. Thanks, Christine. I was going to just ask, are there any potential doc students here? And any data students here? Great. Thanks so much. So yes, I'm Betsy West, and I've been a professor here for uh, over 10 years. I had a long career in uh, network television news, and uh, you know I am a working journalist, and I just made a documentary. So I'm keeping my hand in the business at the same time that I teach here. Uh, so happy to see all your perky faces out there on this gloomy, gloomy morning. Um, this is an interesting, you know, I'm thinking about what's going on at the J School right now. We are um, sort of two months into the program, which begins at the, uh, kind of in the middle of August. And um, I am, uh, even though I do specialize in video and I teach documentary, right now I am knee deep in reporting. And, um, you know, that's really what's at the core of our school is, uh, learning how to find out and uh, report out and confirm facts, uh, you know, which we are uh, extremely devoted here to facts, uh, despite uh, uh, some of the attacks on facts that you may have heard. Uh, that really is at the core of what we do here. So my class uh, right now is, um, uh, working on their final project after a pretty intense uh, two months learning how to think like a reporter, learning how to talk to people, learning how to ferret out information, how to figure out what is news, what's a story, what's going to be interesting to people. It is uh, some of the fundamentals, but we think so important uh, to get you launched on your career. Uh, after this first uh, uh, two months of that kind of training, then uh, the MS students move on to do more specialization. Uh, you take a writing module, you can take video, or you can take audio, or you can take data. Um, there, That's when you begin to kind of specialize out. This is, um, it's pretty short, you know? You're a year from, uh, what, it's from August until the next thing you know, it's May and you're going out the door and we feel like we kind of cram a lot of um, information and experience into this time and it's, uh, it's intense for the students and it's intense for the teachers and, um, you know, we wouldn't do it if we didn't love it. You know, you're already, I'm already feeling a bonding with my class. You know, I, I've only known them for, for a couple of months, but um, getting to know them and seeing them progress and learn how to be reporters is very exciting. Uh, as Christine said, they come from 
uh, a variety of backgrounds. I mean, some of the students in my class have had journalism classes before, and they kind of know who, what, where, when, and how. And some of the students come from overseas. I mean, we do have uh, a substantial international uh, population here, which makes our classes really interesting, I think. Uh, so we have, st I have in my class, let's see, a student from India, a student from China, a student from England, a student from Israel. Um, it's always that way. And, um, you know, everybody's learning from everyone else. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty exciting uh, laboratory mix to have a class like that. Um, in terms of uh, video, I can talk very briefly. Uh, you have an opportunity to take a number of different video classes to really learn how to um, uh, shoot and edit. We have fantastic equipment. The, for those of you interested in that, the uh, Canon C300, uh, C100 uh, camera and access to the Adobe suite. Uh, so we're teaching classes in the regular uh, two semester uh, program which uh, help hone your skills and I think it's something like half of the students take at least one video class now because you know in journalism it's becoming uh, more <laughs> uh, uh, standard that your organization whether or not it's a uh, actually is a video organization would like it if you could go out with a camera every once in a while and maybe document your story a bit so we have a lot of students who take at least one video class and then um, there are opportunities to do more advanced classes in the spring and for those of you who really think hey um, I'd like to do a documentary. I'd like to learn about documentary skills. We have a, a select documentary program that you apply for ahead of time. It's usually about 15 students who go through the regular MS program and then stay for the summer to produce a short, you know, 20 to 30 minute documentary under the tutelage of a very experienced uh, documentary producer, director, advisor. I mean, one of the things that's so great about Columbia, which applies to the documentary program and to all of the programs, is that, you know, we're in New York City. And it's so great, the resources of professional journalists who just kind of wander in and out of the building. Who was it the other day? So, and not, not only journalists, but other people. The other day someone said, is that former Senator Bill Bradley over there? Yes, that was former Senator Bill Bradley who was in the building. And you know, there's always uh, you know, a real healthy mix of professional uh, journalists who are coming here either to just come into someone's class because they happen to be friends with the teacher or to be giving a big presentation here. It's in this room, which is kind of our big you know, lecture hall, and we have a lot of uh, events here in, involving people in the business. You know, I run a little documentary series on Friday nights, and we show first run uh, feature documentaries with their um, directors who come in. So it's uh, being at the J School is is part of being at a very vibrant community that is connected to the world outside. And I think it's the beginning of your uh, kind of being part of a world of people who either went to the J School or admire the values of the J School. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a good community. Uh, I have found, I mean, you know, I, I had a career for nearly three decades and you know I had some involvement here I occasionally would come and talk to a class but being a real part of this community has been a gift to me and um, you know I think it's it's a uh, very rewarding place to be so I will stop there and let you talk Elena yes I'm uh, and it's a gift to us that Betsy West is here. In fact, I was just uh, joking with her that um, she sort of made me famous by association because she's also very humble. She's the director of the sensation, um, the documentary called RBG that some of you may have already seen. And she actually brought uh, Justice Ginsburg here. And there were people Last practically, Friday. <laughs> practically beating down the door to get in here. And I encourage all of you to see it. If you want to be inspired just about the storytelling and the 
uh, and the subject matter. Watch this documentary, and uh, we're so proud that um, you know it is uh, that 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 the creator of this, the director of this, is here with us and teaches our students. And also, as the director of the part-time program myself, has been so generous um, to this cohort of students. David as well has taught the part-time students who are full-fledged MS students, but for a variety of reasons choose to hold on to their day jobs, just as I did when I graduated from the program um, a while ago. And, um, and, and, uh, and instead of taking this program in 10 months as full-time students, spread it out over two years, taking essentially one class a semester. Um, and what I think that you know, both of my colleagues have recognized is that this is an, an extraordinary group of students who are really dedicated. I was talking to um, Jonathan Weiner yesterday, and he was telling me, "Yeah, it's just incredible to me that they work all day, they commute, they have kids, they have demanding jobs, they're already in newsrooms, and they show up at six o'clock at night, and they're just ready to go, and they have so much energy, and they really want it." and um, you know, it's a wonderful opportunity for uh, those of us who have not necessarily been able to, you know, uh, leave our jobs to do full-time graduate work, especially, you know, after just finishing and uh, undergraduate and having some debt to deal with and, um, you know, just wanting to keep our foot in the door of our newsrooms, let's say. It's a wonderful option. Um, and I encourage all of you to look at the web page of our, our part-time program and just watch um, the story of Vladimir Dutier of CBS uh, who came to us after 17 years uh, on Wall Street working in finance and had this long standing desire to be a storyteller, to be a journalist. Everyone told him he was crazy, but when he got here, he threw himself into the study and like so many of us, just had this incredible experience of finally coming to a place, sitting in a classroom, having discussions, meeting people, and and having sort of these really like-minded conversations about storytelling, about social justice reporting, about um, pa a passion for video storytelling, and, and having this enormous feeling like, oh my god, I found my people. These are my people. And, um, and it's just wonderful to see, because it's not easy. And what I tell people is that it's, it's also not a night school. And because as uh, so it's not a nice school, <laughs> <laughs> it's a very nice, nice it's school. It's a nice it's school. It's not a night school. <laughs> you know, in the as as um, Professor West pointed out, there's so much going on in this building. You're going to hear later from the career services folks about all the incredible um, speakers who come to the uh, school to talk about opportunities and what they look for in in, in uh, junior reporters and mid level reporters. What's happening in the industry. And so, like me, you, you know, uh, do want to find a way, even if it's taking a two-hour lunch break, to come up here and listen to a lunchtime talk and then go back uh, to work. Um, it's not easy, but it, it is so rewarding. And they were two of the most amazing years of my life, um, being involved in this community and my people, and uh, then going on to the Miami Herald, where I worked um, and got a job basically out of the Career Expo, which you'll hear about later. It's sort of like all of these elements together from your reporting professor who may, even if you're in a newsroom, bring you to a whole other level of, of, of covering New York City in a way that even with our long our longtime New Yorkers had never experienced before, to a writing module where you basically have a writing coach pushing you and tearing apart your writing, building it back up again. You know, it's exhilarating and it's scary and sometimes it hurts a little bit, but you get through it and, um, you know, it's the experience that at this point in your lives after having graduated from school, maybe working for a little bit, um, you know, is uh, what you um, are looking for and the flexibility that we offer in this part-time um, option is, you know, so for many of us, um, a life preserver because it allows you, again, to stay in New York, pay your rent, cover your expenses, and uh, get a, a piece of this. So um, I will uh, be happy to answer questions from you guys about the part-time experience, but I'm going to turn it over to Professor Haydu to talk about the MA program. Thank you very much. 
Um, one of the themes today so far is that there are multiple ways to practice journalism. Uh, there are multiple approaches to journalism. There are different platforms. There are different schools of content. And there are different approaches to journalism that uh, are appropriate for your vari the various stages in your development as a journalist. And the MA program is designed for people who already have some experience, maybe a fair amount of experience, just but want to do better, want to cut deeper. Uh, you've written something and you've um, shown how smart you are by using describing something as postmodern. And then two weeks later, you want to show how smart you are again, and all you can think of is postmodern. <laughs> and you're not really sure what postmodern means, but you know it sounds good, and you wonder, well, maybe there are Maybe it would help to understand that and know what my, the rest of my options are. I think of the program as um, kind of a, a, a fantasy uh, time machine program. I've never said this b before, <laughs> but it's very much the program that I wish I had been able to take when I was younger. If I could go back in time and, l and learn how to do what I eventually figured out how to do, I would take this program. There was a point in my own development. I mean, I, I'm a music critic. I've written some books. Uh, I've won some awards. One time I walked into Betsy's office, and she had an enormous box on her floor. And, she, uh, and I said, Betsy, can I help you move that? And I picked up, what's in here? Oh, those are my Emmys. <laughs> and I, I opened it up, and there's like 16 <laughs> Emmys or something. And, and she was trying to find a place to move them so that they wouldn't be out because it's ostentatious to show them off. So I have a wall full of awards, too, but they're not Emmys. <laughs> But so I said there was a point when I started writing for The Atlantic and for Harper's and the New York Times Magazine and the New York Review of Books. But that point came late. I was over 40 by that, at that point. And I had been writing and practicing journalism, working as an editor and publishing a lot for 15 years until that point. And I had to learn the hard way by getting, being rejected and taking some night classes and getting advice and learning from editors and just sort of cobbled together a rough approximation of this program myself over 15 years. Well, you, you could do it in a year. <laughs> and um, as Christine Souter said, we have four areas of concentration. We have arts and culture. I co-teach that with the great Elisa Solomon, a longtime theater critic and writer for The Village Voice. Um, we have uh, Politics, which is co-taught by Nick Lemon, a former dean of this institution, Al and Alexander Steele, who's a uh, political writer for The New Yorker and The New York Review of Books. We have uh, Business and Politics, co-taught by Winnie O'Kelly, a longtime business editor at The New York Times, you may know from Bloomberg News on TV, and uh, Science, co-taught by Marguerite Holloway and Jonathan Weiner. I don't know how many Pulitzers and awards w there are in that group, but they, they're, uh, they're, the, they're the best people uh, in their fields. And they're, they're teaching this program, teaching the MA program one term, and then the other term also teaching MS students. So when I'm not teaching the MA, I'm teaching writing about the arts or criticism for the MS students, both part-time and full-time. And all the MA <coughs> faculty does that. So let me give you a, a quick sense of what you'd learn, and I'll use the arts and culture program as an example. You if, you, um, if you elected to uh, take the arts and culture program and were accepted, um, we, you would spend the early part of the fall term learning some theoretical material, uh, some aesthetic uh, theory. What does it mean to be an artist? What is a creative process? W what's the role of the artist in society? We'd look more, more broadly at culture. Uh, then you would hit the ground running, covering an arts festival. And this weekend, our students are doing that. If you just want to get a sense of what I'm talking about, you can look up their coverage. Um, let's see. Do I have the URL? No, it's a Medium site. And look, you could just Google on Medium. Or Google Arts Culture Beat and look for a Medium site, and you'd see what our students are doing this weekend. Mm -hmm. They're out covering an avant-garde arts festival called Crossing the Line. And they're covering very difficult, challenging, obtuse works of art, trying to come to terms with it, make sense of it, 
and communicate what this work is and what it means to the general readership. And that's the essence of our program, to give you the expertise, the authority to write in specialized con con uh, content with depth and true authority, and then to be able to write that in a way that's appealing and fluid for a broad readership. Um, later in the year, we look at Intellectual, copy, intellectual property law, how the art marketplace works, matters of public policy, arts policy, how art is used as, a weapon, as a tool of propaganda. I almost said weapon, a tool of propaganda. Well, sometimes it's arts are weaponized for sure, and we deal with that as well, how arts are used uh, in diplomacy. And we end the second term with an investigative project that we do in collaboration with ProPublica. And last year, our class in the Arts and Culture MA broke a story that we developed in the class um, that began with one of the students being curious about the Kushner's art collection and wondering if they had declared that, you know, among, uh, with in, in, the White in the declarations of the, at the White House, and they began work for the White House. Uh, and they had not. So we, in our class, broke that story, and it was a fairly big story for, for, for a few weeks. Uh, students also do a master's thesis that's a hybrid of uh, scholarly work in that it requires some reading and thinking, but also bedrock journalism, reporting and observation. It's a long form work and uh, it's very serious. Two ye three years ago, one of the students did a piece about the absence of preventative attention for those inclined to impulses of pedophilia. Very daring, and he did this with, with uh, great sensitivity and intelligence, and it was the first long-form piece that this, ever, this student had ever attempted to do. He had never written more than 800 words, and it was a finalist for a National Magazine Award. <laughs> so right out of school, finalist for a National Magazine Award. So I can't promise that, <laughs> <laughs> but we'll try, and that's what we do. So should we take questions from people? What do you think? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll repeat the question. Is there, is there a mic? Yeah. How many yeah, students, here's um, Christine, maybe you need, you, you could How many students? Are we around 200, Christine? Maybe 200. Of the whole program, but the MS program. I mean, in total students here at the journalism yeah. school, MS. it's about 300 mm -hmm. in the full-time MS program, um, about 185. Uh -huh. um, and then the part-time student body is Very about cool. 60 right now, right, Elena? Uh, 34 uh, new students first year right. and yeah. about a 30 30 second, second year. 30 second year, yeah. yeah. Second year. Mm -hmm. Um, there are 40 MA students, there are four new doctoral students, um, but there are about 25 doctoral students in total, and we have 10 um, data, new data students, and there are about 14 people in the dual degree with computer science. So. Hi, um, could you talk a little bit about the difference between the investigative program and the data journalism program? If, if there's some data courses in the investigative program. Do you know that answer? Mm. Uh, uh, let's uh, see, maybe. Christine, do you know that answer? Because that is not, <laughs> I can't. So are there data courses in the investigative yeah. program? The investigative program, you know, there's what used to be called computer assisted reporting and so yes all of the investigative students also learn data journalism techniques um, because you're you're learning how to use to look at large groups of data how to find stories in them um, how to find perhaps support for stories that you're working on so yes the investigative students also get data training I mean we're, we're using you know more and more data in also in our classes. We're really emphasizing just because um, 
it's out there. It's just amazing what is available to you and the kind of reporting that you can do online. So we have started to emphasize that even in just the fundamental, even my reporting class actually next week, we're, we're doing a little more with uh, gathering data, um, how to do that. But I do know the investigative class goes in even deeper in figuring out, as they call it, how to interview data. How to, you know, how to inv how to investigate and and parse data and find a story out of data. And more and more, you will find if you just reading the newspaper stories that really do come out of a look at large sets of data that the government and other organizations compile, taking a look at trends and understanding. I mean, I think that's how Stop and Frisk, that story first came to light here in New York, the practice of stopping and frisking members of minority communities. One of our students was involved in that story, Elsa Chang, who's now the uh, anchor of the NPR show, um, All Things Considered. She was involved when she was at WNYC looking at data that was collected by the state in New York State about the numbers of people who've been picked up for stop and frisk and noticing the disparities in the communities. It's that kind of reporting that investigative is really honing in on. I would say probably the data folks probably take a deeper dive into program languages in Python yeah. and C++ and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, whereas the Stabile students look uh, at, at uh, to a certain extent, um, at those programs that help to look at data, interview it, and clean it, because data is dirty, um, or can be, and um, but also really look at some broader issues with regard to um, access to documents, access to stories, interviewing um, sources that um, may be whistleblowers. Um, that is all an art and a craft that is part of the investigative experience too. Um, a question about the part-time program. Is there flexibility knowing that your day job may uh, have ebbs and flows in terms of how busy you are, or if you're traveling for it, or assignments for that, knowing that you're also trying to balance this at the same time? Well, I will say that um, given that you are taking one class uh, at a time, so you're not taking a full course load, that it's advisable to make sure that your um, editor, your boss knows that, you know, that is sacred time, you know, um, and that you're just simply off the clock then. But, you know, knowing that, that things do happen, the general of ad advice of our dean of students is to be very communicative with your professor, with your uh, dean, with me about your schedule. Um, because, for example, this the seven week writing module is just seven weeks. You know, so if you miss one, just one class, it's a lot to miss out, and it really sort of um, hinders you in your ability to gain as much experience as possible. And you know, in terms of having that conversation with your employer, it's also important to sort of point out all of the resources that you have available here and how that's making you a stronger reporter in your own newsroom and how much um, you can do to create a synergy between what you're doing at work and what you're doing here. Um, but as any journalism school should do, we do have a, a high premium on attendance, on b showing up, being on time. You know, that's part of the training of being a journalist. So, um, you know, gener in generally reporters are really, uh, are, I mean, uh, professors are generally very uh, strict uh, about that. But we try to work with students as much as possible to make sure that we can retain them and that they have um, a strong takeaway in every class. Yeah, I mean, I, I usually have often, I, I, don't I don't have a part-time student in my reporting class mm -hmm. this segment, but I usually have, will have a part-time student in one of my video classes. And in general, what they seem to do is, you know, set aside that day, whether or not it's Tuesday or whatever. I had a student, I just ran into her in the hallway 
um, yesterday from last year. She was commuting from Philadelphia. She had a full-time job. She, um, you know, took Tuesdays off, but I know how hard she was working, and I think sometimes she was, you know, working late at night in her own job to keep it going, and she just got a job in New York and has moved Full, to work here full time, and she was very excited. So it can be done, but I, I, I will agree that as a professor, I'm not going to be very happy if someone comes to me and says, well, you know, I might not be able to make all my classes, and, you know, I just don't know. I mean, if there's one class, something happens, of course, um, you know, you're, you're going to work at, with that and try, to, and try to deal with that, but in general, you, you want everybody there. Um, together because it's intense and, and missing one class is a big deal. Okay, thank you. I'm really interested in broadcast and I was just wondering if the MS program would cover everything even if I don't specialize in a certain area or if the documentary program might be a better fit for that. Yeah. Um, the MS program has a number of options for you to do video. So first of all, in the fall, if you have some video experience, you can test into video two in the fall. If you don't have enough technical experience, then you take video one. But either one of those will qualify you for an advanced workshop in the spring. And a number of those workshops, some of them are geared toward people who are more interested in broadcast, some of them that more on-air skills, and um, you know, also shorter form uh, stories that might be appropriate for broadcast. Some of them are, are more geared toward verite shooting and the style that you might see more online. Uh, if, you know, if you want to do the documentary, um, program, that's giving you a very deep dive into long-form storytelling, even though it's 20 minutes, but believe me, 20 minutes is a long time, and um, that is an opportunity to really get experience as a shooter, editor, and storyteller on a longer form, which can only help you in the future, but might not necessarily be what you want to do. You could probably get a lot of experience uh, in, the, in the regular program. We also just uh, um, built this state-of-the-art oh, yeah. studio. Yeah, um, we renovated our studio, mm -hmm. and it's it's so beyond even yeah. broadcast. You know, we had the faculty got together yesterday. We're brainstorming about all of the ways that we can use it um, in terms of uh, you know doing video storytelling, um, multimedia. Ha the possibilities are endless, and so I think you know what you can do in terms of uh, storytelling with video is. Um, you know, the sky's the limit. Um, for, for those of us who are still in undergrad, um, who might not have a breadth of experience or, or portfolio, um, but are going into, into depth into something specific, would you guys suggest like going into the field for a bit before applying or, or applying right away? Um, yeah. That's an interesting question because we have students who do both. Mm -hmm. We certainly have, I have students who've come right out of undergraduate um, who've decided that they want to, um, even those who might not necessarily have been journalism majors in their undergraduate program, but they've got strong grounding in writing and English and history, political science, economics, they've decided they want to take all of that and, and learn how to be a journalist. And I've had students who've been quite successful at that. I do th think that, um, if this is something you're thinking about and you're not quite sure and you don't know, it, it might be a good idea to go out there for a year or two and, and, and uh, get a job and, and try to experience the business. It's, you know, I'll say that getting a job is going to be a lot easier coming out of the journalism school than it necessarily is out of undergraduate, especially, I don't know what your background is. Some students have, you know, worked on their school paper. They're, the radio station or they've published a freelance article you know they have some experience and they really know that this is what they want to go for in that case then I say yeah do it yeah. I, I would, I'd like, just like to reinforce what Betsy's saying and say that this is really a case-by-case -case matter 
in the 12 years of the MA program, even though the program is designed specifically for experienced journalists, over those years, we've had five or six students who've come directly from the undergraduate ranks. And uh, the faculty is deeply involved in admissions at this school. You know, the, the, in the MA program, <coughs> the members, the, my colleague Elisa and I, we read every word of every applicant. And in those five or six cases, I remember them, I could give you the names, and we sat together and said, well, this person is every bit as good as this other pile of people who have been working for five or ten years. And the, the logo at the top of the clips is the undergraduate newspaper. It's not the New York Times, but this person's smart. And we will, we will take people like that, even in the MA program. We, take, we, we look at each individual case on its own merits. But, you know, we, I've also had the experience occasionally with students who've said, you know, sort of halfway through, I'm not sure I really want to be a reporter. I don't like asking people questions. It seems rude to ask people questions. <laughs> I've had somebody say that to me. And then, you know, at that point, you kind of say, well, maybe this isn't exactly the right thing for you um, because fundamental curiosity, the ability to talk to people, and um, you know, not that you have to be the most gregarious, outgoing person in the world, but you just have to have that fundamental curiosity and mm -hmm. pushing, pushing, always asking, well, wait a minute, always being skeptical. That doesn't totally make sense. And just, uh, uh, that, that's, that's got to be part of you and something that will drive you uh, to a business that's, you know, it's a demanding, it's a demanding profession. You have to be driven by curiosity. Yeah. And so with that, we'll say thank you. Um, we have to keep moving to um, uh, the next part of our agenda. You can find all but of us on the faculty yeah, website. You can email us our emails and we're further very, questions. Yeah. Our email addresses are there, and we actually do check them, and we will, <laughs> and we will answer. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, I would like to invite our student panel. By the way, as um, for those of you who are watching via the live stream, I'm Taryn Almansar. I know I was introduced before, but this is the face with the name. Um, so if you can come to the front, that'll be great. Thank you. Well, thank you um, for taking the time to join us today. Um, and uh, you'll introduce yourselves. If you can say which program you're in, well, your name, the program you're in, what you were doing before the J School, what made you decide apply, and is it what you're expected? And then from there, we'll open it up for questions. Um, for those of you who are watching us via live stream, please ask your questions. For those of you who are here, this is um, your chance to ask people who are in the trenches and who were here uh, probably about a year ago. So with that said, I'll turn it over to Kelly. Mm -hmm. um, can you hear me? My name is Kelly Carrion. Um, I'm a part-time MS student. Um, I also work at CBS News. Um, that's my full-time job. About a year ago, um, I was starting at CBS and I also was considering applying to school um, or not. I was looking at two programs and I didn't want to let go of my full-time job. Um, so Columbia's part-time program was kind of my number one choice for that. Um, and what else? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is it what you're expected? It's it um, um, or? It's definitely, it's challenging. Um, I kind of thought I knew how challenging it was gonna be, but it's definitely more challenging than I thought, in a good way. In a good way, yeah. okay. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. Albert? Mm -hmm. uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Albert Hahn. Uh, I am a full-time student in the, the MS program. 
And I had actually came come into J school without uh, very little experience. I'd studied something completely different in the liberal arts. Uh, two years ago, I graduated, uh, moved abroad, uh, and then I started doing some freelance uh, writing on the side. And um, I got hooked into it, but uh, I realized there was just so much Googling and just fumbling around the dark that you could do. Um, so that's why I decided to, to apply to uh, graduate school in journalism. Uh, I, think, I think it's everything that I, I thought it would be. Uh, I think um, being at Columbia, it's a, it's a short program, everybody says, but it's nice because it works you very hard. You're forced to work hard and you're forced to work very smart. Uh, and there's just so many opportunities uh, in terms of lectures, workshops, not just here in this building, but just across campus. Um, so in that sense, you know, I think it was what I was expecting. Okay. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. Francesca? Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is, excuse me. Um, hi, my name is Francesca. Um, I'm a full-time MS student, also an international student, and I'm in the Stabile Investigative Program. Um, before Columbia, I was working in Washington, D.C. Um, I was reporting on trade and economic policy, generally, um, but there's really only so much, you know, tweet-dictated breaking news that you can cover. Um, so I wanted to, um, you know, go into long form journalism, investigative journalism, um, and actually study journalism formally, because um, I was not a journalism major in, in college. Um, I always knew that I wanted to go to Columbia. It was always my, my number one journalism school. Um, you know, I went to college in New Jersey and I was like looking over the river and, <laughs> um, but um, I, uh, I, I, I wanted to go to Columbia um, for, three reasons, um, you know, like first, because I wanted to report in New York City, um, and second, the Stabile Investigative Program, and third is uh, Sheila Coronel, um, the academic dean who um, um, is like our um, advisor in the Stabile Program. Um, I'm from the Philippines, and she's from the Philippines, and she's like a legend in the Philippines, so I really wanted to learn from her. Mm -hmm. Hi, Ken. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ken Ingram from Nova Scotia, Canada. Um, geez, I'm looking at this website behind us here, and uh, it, it was daunting. I remember I probably clicked on every window and pane on there, broke the mouse <laughs> a few times. And being here, uh, you know, a few months later, it's, it's, uh, it's a little overwhelming. There's a lot behind the scenes that you don't see. Uh, and I think that it was not what I was expecting, but all in, in very favorable ways. I wasn't expecting the amount of work we have to do, <laughs> um, but also the, as you heard just in the panel before us, the um, incredible diversity of the student population we have here. I'm in the MA program that's full-time in the science concentration, so <coughs> we're allowed to take electives on this campus at other schools. So some of my colleagues are taking uh, genetics, others are taking ethnography, ethno ethnography, I can't even say that one <laughs> yeah. this morning, uh, mm -hmm. cybersecurity at SEPA. Um, so you, you gain a lot from that in addition to your core courses that we're taking here in this building. Uh, something I wasn't expecting as an international student uh, is that in the MA program we're not reporting for major media during the program really, uh, and that's mostly due to the visa restrictions as international students. Uh, we can't compete with U.S. journalists. And uh, I think that came as a bit of a surprise to some of us when we were sitting in this room on orientation day. But it's been a blessing in disguise because it allows us to focus on the educational component of this program, take a step back from that mad rush that we're all used to for, for freelance, and to really improve our trade craft, and um, to go into some challenging areas. We're writing an 8,000-word thesis right now, uh, very long form, and the structure, how to put sources into that, and um, it's been incredible so far. Great, thank you. Thank you for sharing your experiences. I'm going to open it up for now for questions, um, but we're going to do this a little bit differently because we want those that are watching via the live stream to hear your questions. If you can stand up and go to the mic, that will be um, perfect. Any questions for our student panel? Remember what I said, these are the people that you want to ask. They were there a year ago, so take advantage of that.
Hi. So it looks like some of you have completed your program and some of you are still doing it. Generally speaking, what did you find was the most difficult aspect of completing the program and what did you, if anything, do to make it work? I think they're all still in the midst of um, in the program. There, um, she started in May because our part-time concentration starts in May. The rest um, started in August. Uh, so they're still in the trenches of what the program is all about. But I think you can, if we can reshape your question a little bit, um, maybe if you can tell him about your actual uh, classwork and what, how do you have managed your time. Time management is key um, as you're going through the program. Um, so if you can talk a little bit about that, that will that work? Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'll start. Um, so I, <laughs> the key to success in the last couple of months has been definitely time management for me just because I have a full-time job. Um, so I, in the summer we had classes twice a week at night. Um, so I also had to make sure that my employer knew that the, during that time, like I, I had to go to class and I couldn't come in because my schedule sh shifts a lot. Um, so just knowing that you know I had to work this day so then after work I had to come to school and do my readings and it was reporting during the summer so it was a lot of making phone calls and going to places um, so definitely I my on my days off were basically doing school work um, and balancing that was a little bit hard but now in my writing module I only have class once a week so then I make that work it's all about finding what fits for you and what times you can do things I would go to this is a funny story I like to tell all my friends I go to work um, seven to three and then I had class at six but I was really tired so I would like find a place and take a nap and then I would be <laughs> ready for class but you make it work mm -hmm. any words of um, of wisdom <laughs> um, I I'm like OCD, so um, I really love like making schedules and making lists and putting everything into my calendar. The hardest part for me in the past two months has been getting people to stay in my schedule um, because you know you're going to be like calling people who you know don't really care that you have a deadline, um, and especially when you're working on a story that requires comment from the government, you have to get your questions in before they leave at Friday at 5 p.m. Um, so that's been the hardest part for me, but you know, the, the answer to that is just like, be really persistent about like checking up on them. Um, you know, whether it's just like a small little statement that you want or like an answer to like a procedural question that you have, or if you're filing FOIA requests, just like following up on those a lot. Mm -hmm. Great. And Thank just, you. and just one quick thing. They put on so many events, career uh, events, lectures, talks. Uh, you could go to one every single day, but it's impossible. So pick and choose <laughs> what you really want to do. And I think that's true, not only for events, but just in general, right? Pick and choose your battles. Yes, absolutely. I liked your uh, <coughs> allusion to trenches. I came here with 20 years of military experience. So the uh, time management, I don't think you need to go to Afghanistan to prepare for this program. <laughs> However, um, I've appreciated uh, who in here has not heard of the New York Minute. Um, I think that's really been the steep learning curve for me is uh, how much you can get done in a day here. We have to be in classes, and you're trying to manage your interviews around that, which is really reliant on other people's schedules. Um, and I, th I think it's that analogy of balancing all these balls. We're all jugglers, and each and every one of you knows what you have to balance in the run of a day. Um, and sometimes that's here on campus, and sometimes that's your home life. That's your aspirations after the program, and we're, I think we're all still learning how to deal with that as we go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Mm -hmm. um, I have. <laughs> um, it's okay. I'm so sorry. It's um, okay. So mm -hmm. I have a question about making choices within the narrow time frame of this year. I wanted to know, you know, when you applied to this program, you may have had a certain, you probably did given, you know, some of the essays you had to write about what you were going to do in this program. Um, did you make choices that were based on employability, practical concerns, you know, that, that made you make a different choice once you were actually here? Or were you conflicted about, say, specializing in one thing or another thing? And if so, how did you resolve that conflict? My professor made the choice for me. 
Um, <laughs> I, I came in here and I was looking to um, develop my knowledge of multimedia reporting. Um, and that was what I was really focused on. Um, I didn't know, I didn't le have a specific preference for what beat I wanted to cover in New York City, um, which is the first thing that you have to decide on um, when you enter, um, you know, the first month of uh, reporting class. Um, and so I was like going back and forth between beats, like which community in New York City do I want to cover? Like which aspect of the government do I want to cover? Um, and I was in an office hour with my professor and he, I told him that my goal ultimately is to be a foreign correspondent and I want to go specifically to Russia. Um, and he said, well, why do you want to go to Russia? And I said, because I studied Russian for four years in college, so um, I might as well make use of that. So he said, well, if you want to cover you know, Russia, you should start with the Russians in New York City. So um, it's been so fun. Like, it was such a good decision to go with that. Um, just because, like, it's, um, it's like, um, it's an underreported community in, in, in New York just because of um, how insular it is. Um, and so the language skills have been helpful with that. And I have not run out of story ideas since I started. Great. Um, I think in, in general, in terms of choices, I think a lot of people stress out about which classes they're going to choose to take, who, which thesis advisor they want, and there's a lot of stress over that, right? Sometimes people don't get what they want. And I think um, there's, I think there are little opportunities here to make the bad choice because there's just so many, you know, great professors, great classes. Even if you don't get your first elective choice in the spring, uh, you'll still end up with something that you might enjoy. And I remember that because I've talked to many students from previous years who have told me that, mm -hmm. not to stress out about you know, all the choices you have to make. So, Great advice. Yeah. <laughs> Next question. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about some of the projects that you've gotten to work on so far and uh, what you want to do your thesis on? <laughs> uh, um, uh, if, if I can start. Sure. <coughs> Our first assignment we just wrapped up yesterday, and it was a 850 word uh, story based on a science journal that we had to find. And that sounded really easy until we started getting into it and looking at the online catalog that's here at the libraries. Uh, absolutely overwhelming and stress went through the roof. And it was because I think you not only had to get to know the databases and uh, the wealth of information that's available to you once you're a student, but also um, looking at how these uh, scientific studies are done, uh, the veracity of them, are they reliable, is it something that you would actually pitch to a media outlet and put your name on the byline to, and then calling the people who did the study and having others either confirm or disprove what they've done. Uh, so we wrapped that up on Friday and I ultimately did a story about crickets uh, in Hawaii and they found that a certain species um, of uh, crickets, uh, the males are, are mute, they can't call out to mate and uh, contrary to what we would think, they would be going out of the gene pool. The researchers found that they're actually listening to males who can sing and hanging out around them until the females come <laughs> along. So it was fun and I think uh, that's something to keep in mind. I think. Before I came into this program, that word fun was not really in my vocabulary. But if you follow the stories that you find interesting and intriguing, that will usually take you to your next step. And I think that you should be thinking five years down the road of where you want to be. And looking at this is one of those stepping stones to get there. Mm -hmm. Great advice. Um, mm -hmm. I guess I can talk next. Um, our beat this summer was immigration, um, which is something that I always like to do just write stories about immigration um, and I had to write two story 800 to um, 1200 words um, so I went out to this program in the Bronx that um, has a lot of uh, first generation immigrant girls playing soccer and kind of how that helped um, them uh, assimilate to the community um, and I kind of, when I came first to school, I kind of have a track of like, this is what I want to do. Like, I really like video, so I want to do video. But for our writing module, we got presented for the part-timers three different classes. It was opinion writing, narrative writing, and arts and culture, or something like that. And I never thought that I would want to do opinion writing um, or learn about opinion writing, but um, 
it was a class with Jelani Cobb. Uh, he writes for The New Yorker, and he's, like, the best. If you, if you come and you get a chance to take class with him, please do. Um, so I was like, I'll just take it. And I've actually figured out how challenging it was. A lot of opinion pieces, you're like, oh, I'm just writing, like, what I think. But it takes a lot of extra reporting to form um, these pieces. So uh, that was definitely something that I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to do this, but I'll just do it and actually worked out great. So always challenge yourself in that way. I can tell you about the the story I just filed uh, last night. Um, so I was, um, like a few weeks ago, I was talking to one of my sources. We were just getting coffee. Um, and he mentioned, oh, did you know that it takes 300 days for a Russian to get a US visa? And this is just like a tourist visa, right? And I'm like, 300 days, that's like nearly a year. So I thought there might be a story there. Um, and there was a story um, of like how um, in August 2017, um, when uh, Putin kicked out like um, 755 US diplomats from Russia, um, the consulates in Russia, like the US consulates, there's four of them, they were so severely understaffed that they had to cancel all existing visa interview appointments. Um, and just like think about how big Russia is and how many people live in Russia. Um, so it was just like it was a giant bureaucratic mess. Um, and I was like I was starting on it as like a local New York story just because there are so many Russians here. And I was thinking, oh, like maybe they had family who wanted to come to their wedding or come to a funeral or just visit them um, who weren't able to do that because of the difficulty of getting a tourist visa. And then it turned into an international story. Um, and at one point I was talking to um, someone in Moscow on the phone. Um, and I thought to myself, is the government listening? In on this? <laughs> but that was really fun to report. Great. Wow. Mm -hmm. Next question. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, so I'm thinking about kind of the different backgrounds that students come to the school with um, and the different levels and areas of expertise. Um, and I'm wondering whether classes are structured in such a way that you can kind of collaborate and learn from your classmates or if it tends to be more kind of heads down. Um, in, in terms of collaboration, I think it uh, depends on the class. For example, in our reporting class now, for our last story, uh, we're partner up with uh, a classmate to work on a multimedia project, so a video uh, or a photo essay, something like that. I know, for example, in uh, video classes, usually you go out with a partner, somebody you know has the camera while the other person does the reporting. Uh, so I think there's a lot of opportunities in terms of uh, collaboration. I think a lot of the skills you have to learn in the beginning are you do it by yourself simply because, you know, that's how you operate you know, a lot of the time. But then after that, I think that, you know, there are possibilities for, for working together. Yeah. Our science concentration is highly collaborative. Um, we have an immense amount of readings to do. I, I'm happy to say that they've all been incredible. Um, <laughs> we learned something not only from the readings, but we're having the authors who are multiple award winners come in and speak to us about the background story of how that came to be, as well as the in-class discussions. I know at SIPA, I was in a class the other day, we were talking about Azerbaijan, and there was a student in there from Azerbaijan, which sometimes is a double-edged sword, because when I'm the only Canadian in a room, suddenly I'm expected to know everything about Canada. <laughs> and, but uh, no, and uh, we have uh, an individual in my class from Chile, as well as India. A um, few New Yorkers uh, in the mix. It's it's very collaborative. Uh, we were helping on uh, Google Docs with our drafts leading up to this deadline yesterday, and it's interesting because we all come from different backgrounds. So uh, we have a, a um, woman from Belarus who is a documentary filmmaker, so she's not used to writing long form. So uh, she has a different approach to writing a story than we would, and it's it's been awesome. Thank you. The following question. Mm -hmm. uh, Hi, so my name's Steph, um, and I have a question for, um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you said your name was Alfred or? Albert. 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 Okay. They printed it wrong uh, on yes. the, the schedule, on but the, it's okay. On, it's the, fine. Albert, yeah. on the name yeah. card, yeah. Um, so I'm similar to you. I come from a separate background, like have minor experience in writing. I studied engineering, and now I work in finance on Wall Street. How would you recommend, and obviously would love your guys' input as well, um, for someone like me that has very little experience, how would you recommend like 
getting more experience assembling work to show and in terms of applying and like everything else? Um, I, that's a great question. Um, because I, I actually, yeah, I, I came out of college with zero experience. Um, and so when I was living abroad, I, I was living in Barcelona for two years. And, uh, you know, it came application time and I started panicking. I, you know, I, I, I had like a hundred page thesis that I could give in, but that wouldn't, you know, be very helpful in a journalism uh, uh, clips, they call it. So, I, you know, there, in, last year, um, just to go off the track a little bit, uh, there was like this whole political movement, independence, Barcelona, right, whatnot. So I, I sort of seized the opportunity to just start a blog of, and I just started practicing writing my own news stories. You know, I, I you, know, you learn things, most basic things like uh, inverted pyramids or how to write a lead. And then you just start playing around with it. And uh, that's what really helped because, you know, I did that for two months. So by the time I applied, I could say, well, you know, I, I don't have any formal experience, but, you know, I took the initiative to, to start a blog to write these news stories by myself. Uh, and I think that that helps in some sort of way. And, and you can also try freelancing. And I think it's great you have experience in engineering and finance because that means that you have a set of knowledge that few other people in this field do. And you could definitely take up opportunities to, to write about it. Also, business journalism pays better. Uh, <laughs> not as much as Wall Street, I'm sure. But so, you know, that's, that's a positive. So, yeah, freelancing, uh, you know, do your own thing. I think that would be good. Awesome, thank you. Okay. Follow me. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Hi, my question is for Francesca about the investigative program. Why did you choose the program and what skills and tools have you learned here at Columbia that you wouldn't anywhere else? Um, I wanted to do the investigative program almost purely because of Sheila. I wanted to learn from her and work closely with her. Um, but uh, on Thursday night, we had this guy, this journalist, who's an alum of the Stabile program, and he's sort of like a FOIA Jedi master. Um, and he shared he shared his ways with us and like how to approach FOIA in a way that like they don't really tell you if you just like um, like read like how how to request um, you know government records and all that. So it was like it was very insightful, um, and she does that a lot. Like every single week, she invites someone um, to come speak with us. Um, and you guys know the New York Times story that broke on Wednesday. Um, the, that same day, we asked her if we could have the reporters who worked on that story to come to class and talk to us. And she said, like, yes, like, no questions asked. Um, so she's going to work on that for us. But she also has, um, like, former students who've gotten their work published um, come to speak with us and, like, tell us, like, how did you even get the idea for the story to begin with? What was your process? What documents did you look at? Um, and I don't really know what I was expecting from the investigative program when I started, but now that we're, um, we're like deep into looking for our topics, and in a couple of weeks we're gonna have to commit to our um, master's project topics, I'm really enjoying like looking through court records and property records and like lawsuits and all that. Um, so uh, that's like something I wouldn't have learned otherwise. Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. And the last question. Hey, mm -hmm. thank you guys. Um, I, in the earlier panel, we heard a bit about the data coursework that is sort of part of, uh, there's a concentration and then touches on a bunch of the other sort of programs. I wonder if you can talk about whether and to what extent that's sort of played into your own experiences so far. So this is what Albert was talking about. It's really difficult to choose which um, like multimedia class you want to take. Um, so in the beginning, I was really set on doing video one in the fall and then data one in the spring, just so I could have a mix of that. But then in boot camp, I realized that I really enjoy audio um, and would probably like to pursue radio journalism. Um, so yeah, I think I'm gonna just go with radio in the spring. <laughs> That's totally fine. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm, t I'm, I'm, I'm going to take audio, I mean, not audio, data, data, data in, a, in a few weeks. So in the fall, you, like Francesca said, you can choose between audio, data, uh, data video, um, and, or photo. 
And so that's already a built-in component where you have seven weeks of, uh, there's data one, which is just mostly doing a lot of stuff with Excel. Uh, and then data two, which is more complicated, a lot of coding, uh, things like that. Uh, but just in our reporting classes from the day one, the, I think like um, what Professor West said earlier, there's a lot of emphasis on using data. Uh, our class covers a lot of ethnic communities. So we go on different city government websites uh, that have open data sets and we're taught how to look for things, uh, how to you know, use data in our stories, um, different ways to find you know, publicly available information, both on the federal level, city level. Uh, so, so, and and every you know way that you go, you, you'll you'll find some way. And there's also the Brown Institute. Uh, if you don't know, that's an amazing resource that uh, Columbia has. It's a it's dedicated to to data journalism. They have uh, lectures and they have workshops that are open to uh, all students. So even if you're not a data concentration student, you know, for example, next Saturday there's a whole day uh, workshop on data and polling, uh, yeah, and political races. So, you know, those are opportunities that you can take advantage of, even if you're not in data journalism, so to speak. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, I would <coughs> like to thank our student panel. Thank you for taking the time to come in and have an honest chat with everyone. Um, so thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Okay. So with that said, I would like to invite my colleague, Gina Bouillon, who is um, the Director of Career Services. Good morning. Go ahead and stretch while I get my PowerPoint set up here. There's a lot of food in the back if you want to grab something. So come on back as soon as you can. We're going to close the drape, so don't be uh, disturbed. But Gina's got a bunch of uh, very interesting pie charts yes. and graphs and things that she's going to be putting up for us. Please come on back as soon as you can. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start. So these are pictures of the Career Expo, which if you come here, you will experience in the spring. Oh. I'm, I'm going to just invite everybody to please have a seat. Okay. So it's the biggest career fair, purely journalism career fair that happens 
in the U.S. and uh, more than 50, 150 companies come every year. It's been that way for five or six years, and it's pretty fabulous. Uh, and there have been, you know, changes along the way, you know, a different sort of balance of different kinds of companies to reflect the changing industry. It's very exciting. Um, so nice, nice to meet you all, and hello to those who are tuning in from online. Uh, I'm part of a small team of career development, and we are all former journalists ourselves, which gives us an advantage in advising students and also talking to employers and understanding what employers are looking for. And uh, students who attend this school get one-on-one -on -one advising and uh, pretty intense, pretty intense one-on-one -on -one advising that sort of continues throughout the year. And uh, it, it leads up to the Career Expo, but it continues a after that. Uh, so first, the reality check. Uh, there's, there's no guarantee of a job from journalism school after graduation. We have no idea how the industry will change over the year. We can't anticipate which companies come May will um, find a second life, who will fo fold, you know, the, the companies that will have layoffs. We don't know the new companies that will crop up over the year. Um, we don't know what the job market's ever going to be, be like, you know, May 9, 2019, May 2020. But, uh, but one thing has definitely sort of become clear to us since we've been, you know, intensely studying uh, the statistics of the, of the classes for the last, you know, do dozen years at least, is that the Columbia students do really well in the job market and weather the ups and downs of the general economy and also of the, of the much more quixotic um, journalism economy. So there are, there are, you know, it's, it's a very exciting time to be a journalist and your questions to the panel of students were really good. And I just, I want you to, to know that there's, you know, th there's a lot of um, new skills that you learn here that are uh, hard to learn on the job. And so J School has become sort of, um, it's a very intense really hard year, but it's also only a year. So that's, you know, a lot of students come here to sort of get it over with so they can get the job of their <coughs> dreams. And I want to now talk to you about um, how the class of 2018 did in the journal, in the uh, job market. And I'm gonna show you some very exciting statistics and pie charts. And uh, this will give you just a better idea of how our students do, but also how the industry itself is, is shaping up. So the first chart is where students landed in the class of 2018. And this is of uh, a couple of weeks, within a couple of weeks after graduation. We do a big survey. It's really hard to read, isn't it? Uh, is there a way to, to sort of take down the lights, dim the lights on the, on the screen? Pardon me? It looks great on the left. Okay, good. All right. Um, so what you're seeing here is this is MS and MA students mixed. It's a, it, it represents, so basically almost 74% uh, of the class had something at graduation. And, you know, our class is, is diverse. It's, it's, you know, people who have been out of um, college for a while and have been working, people who are working part-time. And what you're seeing is that the, the biggest chunk, that big blue slice right, right there, that's, that's internships. And I want you just to, to come in, you know, eyes wide open, the most likely outcome of J School immediately after graduation is an internship. Is that too dark? <laughs> okay, that's fine. Um, oh, that, that looks pretty. Okay, um, and, a, and a lot of people do get full-time jobs, but the internship idea, I just want you to know, it's a, we're talking paid internships only. These are at, you know, companies that most students really want to work at, um, obviously, and nobody takes an unpaid internship. That has sort of gone out, um, out the, by the wayside. It's, I would say out of every class, there's maybe one or two people who do a, an unpaid internship and there's always like a very specific reason why they do that um it's it's their dream company and and there's the, it's the only or it's the only um they just had to work there because they knew that it would leave somewhere but it's really not the norm our students do paid internships 
um, and they last for anywhere from uh, the summer to six months. Some of them are a year long. Um, internships, fellowships, we use the terms rather interchangeably, and they are typically job tryouts in companies. When, a, when an employer has a grad student on their hands, they, are, they know that that grad student wants a job at the end and that's the sort of like the the likely outcome of for our students that they go from an internship into a full-time job either at that place or at a different place with help from the editor and and recommendations for the from the editor so it's a diff you're in a sort of a different class when you're um, an intern and also you're really well trained um, I, I happen to I was talking to a college student recently who happens to be related to me, and uh, she was telling me that you know all of her friends on the student newspaper don't think that they need to go to journalism school, that they can just learn all of it on their own. And it's really hard to do that these days. There's too many technical skills that you need to learn. Data, for instance, learning how to comb through data sets, combine data sets, look for stories, fill in gaps on data sets. It's, it's t painstaking and it's hard, and it's hard to get a busy editor to teach you how to do that if you don't know how to do that. And so this is this is the sort of an incubator for learning all that stuff and learning how to file a FOIA and learning how to interview and just getting practice interviewing and, and gathering, uh, learning how to work, work a camera and, and all this. It's hard to learn on the job. It used to be that um, you know, you didn't need to know these skills necessarily to get a journalism job right out of J school. But, you know, in this particular um, state where this person related to me works, uh, there is an editor I'm thinking of who won't, doesn't like to hire any of the undergrads in, in, in the many good colleges that are in that state because she has been spoiled by Columbia Journalism School students and she knows that the students come really well trained. So. Um, this is so. This is the um, sort of a picture of where students students go. The freelancing slice, which is sort of light purple on this, it's not a big. Um, when I, it says seven percent, which equals you know I don't know. It's 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 not that many students, but freelancing is an actual you know. It, some some students do come into the school thinking I love the freelance life. I really have that sort of entrepreneurial sort of spirit. I want to do freelance, and I'm you know. So some people really do do it for for the freedom of it, especially if they want to go ab abroad. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a piece of the pie that has sort of been dwindling over, over the years, which we actually take as a, as a good sign. Okay, let me just show you another picture. This is also really interesting. So this is the kinds of jobs, I mean, do, job duties that our students get. And I would, I would venture to guess that this is probably pr pretty representative of what's going on in the industry at large, where the vast majority of students, at least from Columbia, are getting jobs doing text print reporting, basically. Like if people just, you know, most of our students are doing jo reporting jobs where they're editing. Either they're editing and, and writing for a website or a newspaper or a, a, a broadcast company on the digital side. And what's interesting about this information is this, these, this, this statistic is, these statistics are for across all platforms. So I'll just let you take a look at that. The on-air reporting piece of it, does anybody here want to do on-air reporting? So that's a small number, but it grows after graduation. And, uh, and the reason is, is this. The, the small stations across the country that hire our students to be on-air reporters, there isn't the tradition of internships and fellowships in that, in that field. So our students basically are waiting until graduation to put their reel together, send it out across the country, and they're interviewing for full-time jobs. So the reason why this seems like a very tiny percentage is because they're finding jobs like in the summer after we complete our our, our uh, data collection and, and reporting. But we definitely have a lot of students fanned out across the country doing, doing on-air reporting. Okay, this, I love this, this, this graph because it shows you how the industry has changed over the many years. What you're seeing is on this, on this uh, chart is the rise and sort of sustained rise of digital only positions. That's the yellow line at the top. And you're seeing, uh, you're seeing newspapers kind of hold steady. That's the orange line. And bouncing a around a lot and sort of like changing places with video broadcast um, and audio, you know, broadcast jobs. Um, every year it seems like 
that those the, the two the, the red line and the orange line really bounce around and but over time as you can see they've sort of hung in there um, and so the yellow line digital only jobs broadcast jobs and internships and newspaper jobs and internships are roughly like 30 percent each of the class and this has been the case for a long long time and going back to the other slide, regardless of what the platform is, most of the students are getting hired to do reporting jobs, okay? And the, the uh, green line is sort of shows what we all kind of know intuitively, the sort of inexorable slow decline of jobs in magazine only, uh, magazine jobs and the digital side of magazines. And uh, this is, you know, it's magazines have had a tough time sort of um, translating uh, to, to the web. And, uh, and also that another thing that's happened at the same time as magazines sort of decline is the rise of digital only sites that, that produce voicey narrative writing that students like to do and train for. So some of those jobs that, you know, that were lost to magazines sort of are, are, are being sort of taken up in, in the digital only sort of category. And then the brown line at the bottom is wire service jobs, um, which saw a little bit of a, a decline for quite a while and then sort of increased last year. We don't know what that's about. Um, the, the, de the decline was over the, la over the first, you know, many years on that chart was probably the result of Dow Jones and Wall Street Journal combining. They had been sort of separate operations and they are the same company, but they had sort of separate bureaus and it didn't make any sense economically. So Wall Street Journal Company combined those and so a lot of those jobs were, were lost. But our, our, our students do get jobs at Bloomberg, Agence France Press, Associated Press, um, and, uh, and Wall Street Journal. Those are the big wires where our students really like to go because they're, they're sort of a track to, well, they're financial journalism, but they're also a way to, to be an international correspondent. Um, the bureaus, that, these hundreds of bureaus that Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, Agence France Press, and AP have are, in, are, are across the globe, and your students have to often do financial journalism in, in those sites. So it's a pretty hot, hot field, even though it um, takes up a rather small piece of the pie. Okay, now I would like to show you, you should have a, a list um, in your handouts of the companies that hired students in, out of the class of 2018. There's about 110 companies on that list and you can peruse it at, at your at your leisure. leisure. There were about um, almost 300 students in the class and 110 companies that hired them, so that tells you that, that uh, most companies hired more than one. And what this um, what this is showing you is there's there's a lot of lo Columbia love out there in the journalism world, and a lot of companies <laughs> scoop up hire a lot of J school grads at the end of every year. And this is showing you just how powerful the school's um, brand and the quality of the students um, was with for, and for these companies. And again, this was as of early June. Um, CNN. For instance, the year before in 2017 had hired like 11 people out of the class um, as of graduation. And this summer, you know, they hired a few more. So CNN's really, um, really likes Columbia. A lot of companies do. And, you know, this is as of graduation, like I said. These numbers tick up throughout the summer for sure. So. Um, as you're deciding whether to do J school or not, or just go into the field, I would encourage you to do some l research on LinkedIn. I was doing this, uh, a, you know, a couple of weeks ago, just sort of going on to, to LinkedIn. The, the, the Columbia Journalism School journal has its own LinkedIn, and I believe you have access to it. You don't have to be a member of the group, but I encourage you to go onto that page, click on the alumni button, and just so start entering your favorite, you know, um, journalism operations and just see what kinds of jobs people have and how many of people are at these places. So I was limited in, in the way I could search. I, I have, I, I'm pretty sure it's a lot more than 15 at BuzzFeed News I j because I was thinking of people and they weren't showing up on my LinkedIn. Um, so I, who knows who knows why that is. But I did just a quick search and you should too. And you should do this for every school that you're interested in because it's, it's, you know, it's public information. But this is the, uh, the, the I, I made sure to count only students who were 
who were currently in jobs at these organizations, not bloggers or contributors, and also not students who were who went to the publishing course here. I was just looking for MA and MS students who graduated from from the J School. So it's a fun exercise, and you know, if, if you are, are really you know stuck on you want you want to you know work in California, for instance, you ought to do this same exercise with Berkeley's um, web uh, LinkedIn and and USC's if you're interested. So now I'd just like to show you sort of what our students do after graduation. Um, this is our student who was hired at the Washington Post this last summer, and she had a really unusual background. She was a Brooklyn um, district attorney. So she had uh, years of experience prosecuting special crimes, uh, sex, sex abuse, child abuse, domestic violence cases, and we thought it was, um, we didn't anticipate that the Washington Post would would choose her because she didn't have all that much journalism experience. She had done some some freelancing that was pretty impressive, and you know, in the Marshall Project and, and in Rolling Stone, um, but she didn't have sort of the classic uh, application that we that, that the Washington Post usually hires. And uh, this is the, this is the kind of stuff she's been really busy. Let's just say uh, she's been writing a lot of stories, and they're leaning on her legal expertise. Uh, another couple students, the, the Antonia and Joseph, won a Polk Award this year. You may have heard about this story. The story of the Motel 6 receptionist calling ICE and handing over the list of Mexicans who checked in at night. That was our students. Uh, Antonia was a 2016 grad, and Joe was a 2017 <coughs> grad. And they did this story in 2017. So this was a phenomenal piece of shoe leather reporting. They were hanging out in the parking lots of, of Motel 6s and talking to absolutely everybody and gathering a lot of statistics. And for their work, they won lots of awards, but the, the biggest was the George Polk Award. And uh, it was for the immigration reporting. And shortly after this, uh, Antonia was hired away by the Washington Post. That just, that just happened in, in August, by the way. So now I want to just show you some tra trajectories before and after Columbia to show you sort of typical, I didn't cherry pick, I literally just went from in the resume book and went page by page until I found, found somebody who had had like a little bit of experience before they came to Columbia. So Alexandria was at a tiny paper that is not a daily in Pacific Palisades, California. And she came to Columbia, and then she got the internship at the Miami Herald, and now she's a reporter at the Asheville Citizen Times, a job she took because she really wanted to go to a smaller uh, newspaper and report on big issues. And as soon as she got there, she asked if she could cover some angle of the opioid um, uh, um, epidemic and they said yes and so the story she came up with was a, turned into a multi-part series on how children are treated in the um, ha what happens to kids of opioid addicts and how the school system and the hospital systems and the various system systems um, come to their rescue or, or not and uh, it was a it was a terrific series I think it was five days and there was videographers attached to the story and, and photographers so she's she's a happy camper and Asheville is in the corner it's, it's in the corner of north, the, the sort of the northwest corner of, of North Carolina, so she, her reporting took her into the neighboring states as well. Sarah was a freelance fixer for BuzzFeed and other um, news organizations in Turkey. She, she didn't have any clips. Um, she was just a sort of a behind the scenes fixer, and she came to Columbia, and then she got the graduate trainee uh, fellowship from uh, at Reuters, which I, I believe they, um, they put her in. Well, I don't actually remember if, it, if she was if she was sort of stationed in London or in the Middle East. But it's a nine month program, and after that, uh, the Istanbul hired her full, full time. Um, Anade was um, was an executive assistant at a at a small sort of doc 
company in, in Cape Town, South Africa. She came to Columbia, and then she was an Al Jazeera UN fellow, which is a pretty low-paying job, but it's kind of fun. It's really fun. And after that, she was hired. It's sort of the dues that Al Jazeera makes um, makes you pay. Is, um, they don't have they don't spend a lot of money on their on their interns, but you do you do get in the pipeline, and it's really hard to get on Al Jazeera's radar without having been an, an intern. Um, Anna was from Russia, and all her clips were in Russia. She was a really good. Uh, you know, investigative reporter at the at the um, the biggest paper in in Russia. She came to Columbia. She was an MA MA politics student, and she took an internship after the MA program. She took an internship at CoinDesk. She took a class in cybersecurity over at SIPA, and she got really into um, Bitcoin and cybersecurity and and the Russia angle. And they hired her full time, and they are saying that they will sponsor her. We also get career changers here. Uh, is anybody here a career changer? Okay, good. So uh, Brian was, he had 10 years of real estate experience in, um, in New York City covering, uh, selling, you know, apartments and, and he, fr from apartments to townhouses. He came to Columbia and the first thing he said was, I don't want to be, be a business reporter. And I, I just remember telling him that's a real shame because you could totally get a, a job, you know, covering, you know, business and real estate. Um, but as it turns out, as the year progressed, he discovered that he loves business reporting and he took a six month fellowship at Business Insider and they have him on a sort of a transportation beat but it's a, it's a business it's a business beat deanna is the uh the brooklyn dada that i uh mentioned earlier who was kept on after the summer at, at after the summer internship which hardly ever happens but the boss the these big newspapers and big companies don't often keep the new york times and the washington post they don't often keep their summer interns but every so often one or two people get to stay and she was uh one of the one of the uh people who got to stay Andrew had no experience, but he was really well read, and he had an interesting job in the in the Navy in the in the Seventh Fleet, and he came to Columbia, and then he went back to Asia to do an internship at the South China Morning Post, which is an English language paper, and as a result of being English language, it doesn't have as many sort of restrictions on it because I guess the assumption being that most people can't read it, so uh, he can um, you know there's more more sort of free freer reporting. And and then he came back to the J School, and he's there now at, at Columbia Journalism Review, doing a doing the one-year fellowship. Uh, he was also the valedictorian of last year's class. So we also get a big group of students who come directly from college. Without you know, you've, maybe you 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 know you're about to graduate in May, and then you start J School in the following September. So Jennifer was at the uh, at UC Berkeley, and she was a government reporter. She came to Columbia, and then she got an internship at Splinter, which is uh, Gizmodo's politics uh, vertical. And now she's uh, she's still uh, she's an at Slate and in an internship. Um, Catherine was the editor-in-chief of the Haverford College paper and also a distance runner, as I recall, on the captain of the team. She went to Bloomberg as a, re as a reporting intern and then Bloomberg hired her. And Jing was um, at Yale and he did not have a lot of uh, journalism experience. He had done some filmmaking at Yale. He came to Columbia. And he got, he had a few internships. Uh, he was an international student, so he just kept, you know, plugging away and plugging away, jumping from internship to internship, and finally got hired at Christian Science Monitor, and they have agreed to, they agreed to sponsor him. So I guess the moral of the story is that Columbia is a place that, that transforms people. Um, we, we do have, um, a, a wide range of, of students here, and it's an exciting place to go. And I, I know that a, after I, after you know working here for a dozen years, our students do really well in the job market and get all the most desirable jobs. I'm I'm not e at all exaggerating, and uh, and so it's it's a place that um, you know if you if you desire you know if you have your mind eye, eye on certain places, you you ought to. Um, you know, do, do your research and also interrogate the data on other schools' websites. The data that I showed you is, um, I don't think you're seeing a lot of pie charts on other websites, but you, you, you know, if you're thinking of going to another grad school, you should definitely ask the, the same questions that, um, that I've sort of presented to you. You should ask, um, if they've got statistics on their website, you should ask when the data was collected and how many people are in the sample, the you know, basic questions. 
that is all I had to talk about today. If we want to bring the lights up, I, I can take some questions if you have any. Somebody asked about investigative versus data. We're actually seeing a lot of overlap. We're seeing students struggle with whether they should apply to the data program or the stabile program. There's definitely overlap. And uh, some of the skills are this, the same that you, that you learn. I mean, all students are learning some data, some data here. Everyone takes investigative techniques. These are really important skills. And data is, you know, it's not just a matter of downloading nice, nice tidy data sets. There's a lot of compiling that you have to do on your own. And, and you learn those skills here. Because as it turns out, you know, when big data first started happening, everybody was talking about big data, journalists everywhere thought, oh, this is going to be great. We're just going to press download. And there the story will be. Well, as it turns out, government officials don't keep very tidy data, and they don't necessarily communicate with each other across state lines, so or even across county lines. So there's so much gathering and fixing and and um, filling in that that you have to do when you're looking at data. And uh, this is it's painstaking. It takes time. It's expensive. And here you 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 know you do learn those tools. Anybody have any questions about jobs? And I think you should go to the microphone because then it'll go to, it'll get recorded so, so people can hear it across the world. This is kind of hot. Wait. Uh, yes. Hello. Okay. Hello. So my quick question, which is somewhat ambitious, is, is there any like crossover between the MA program specifically with an arts and culture focus and the MS? Like, um, so if you're in that MA program, are you able to take um, like documentary coursework, specifically video classes and things of that nature? I don't believe so, but there's some skills classes that you can take. So now mm -hmm. the data students, I mean the MA students can take a data, they do get some data um, instruction mm -hmm. in their class, but they can't parachute into like video, video one or, yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's, the assumption is you're already, you know, a journalist and you know this stuff, and so you're coming here to sort of focus, drill deep into a subject subject matter. Hello. Hello. <coughs> My name is Taylor Dudley. Um, I wanted to know, in regards to MS students with special specialization in documentary filmmaking, um, at the career fair, will there be production companies there or people? who specialize in film and video? Yes, there are always a, a good number of small documentary companies at the Expo. There are also a, a good number of podcast companies at the Expo. That is That group of companies has really grown in the last few years. Um, but the dot companies, you know, if you start studying dot companies, they ha all have a sort of a different focus. Um, so, you know, there was one of them, like Rain Media is based in Brooklyn does a lot of, you know, big, ambitious, international stories um, for Frontline. And mm -hmm. there's something called Transformed Films that, that does a lot of poverty-related um, documentaries. There's, so they, you'll find that they all have sort of niches. Gotcha. Yes. Thank you. Hi. Hello. I have um, an 18-month-old and a 3-year-old at home. And, Congratulations. Um, thank you. I'm their primary caregiver. I'd be mm -hmm. switching careers as well from social work. And I'm wondering how feasible it is to have a career in journalism. I actually would like to do freelance journalism maybe or, you know, work from home for a how realistic is that to want to go in and do that? Or is it sort of like you start as an intern, you live there? Because I really want to stay home with them as much as possible. I want to be there when they get home from school and all of that stuff that a lot well, of people, you know. I, I, don't, I don't deny that's hard. It's going to be hard. Um, but, you know, we have had uh, plenty of parents here who have sort of figured out what they're willing to sacrifice. I mean, by the, we've, we've seen some parents say, you know what, I think I, I need to do an internship just to sort of like get some experience, get some daily work, and then maybe freelance. We've also had, had um, people just become freelancers, and that's totally fine. Uh, you, you, you develop a lot of contacts here. There's tons of networking that happens. 
And when you do an internship, do you sort of live there? Is it like a really competitive? You inc- live there if you want to do a good job. Um, you live. Right. You, you 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 knock yourself out if you want to be the one that stands out that summer. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. I mean, however, you know, it's short term. It's ten. It's ten weeks. Um, I'm not saying that it's. You have to. You don't have to do it. There are plenty of people that say, you know what? It's not for me. I I, I need to freelance. It works better for my lifestyle or whatever. Um, or people who need to take more of a like a, a nine to five type of type of job. Um, there's you know, but I just I, I, it, there is definitely room for, you know, everyone's a grown up who applies to J school. You can do what you want, and that's why that first pie chart was so varied. There's just so many options. I noticed freelance was small. <laughs> yeah. Why. Well, it's small because it's it's not particularly well paying. You know, um, unless unless you're really well established. You know. It's a, a student just starting out can't demand the high, pay, you know, uh, pay per per article. So it's just one of those fields that you know it takes a certain personality. There are definitely some sort of, you need to be entrepreneurial and anyway, but it's very it does offer flexibility. That's for sure. Yes. Hi. So Hello. I've been out of college for a while and have done all sorts of crazy stuff. I've lived overseas for a few years. And I've realized that the internship does seem to be a very important thing to do in order to get your foot in the door. So what's the actual process for getting an internship? And additionally, I, you know, I said I would love to go overseas again. What's the likelihood of that? And does having that experience sort of help you as far as an internship or career as a foreign correspondent? Uh, Okay, so the internship season is right now. So for the very biggest companies, um, news operations, the deadlines are in the fall for the big print operations and the big uh, and the wire services. In the in the spring, there are a lot of deadlines for more broadcast focused um, companies and uh, audio and video and also just smaller companies. And so there's de- deadlines throughout the year. So students are applying right now. And they'll a lot of them will find out, you know, within the next couple months if they've got something lined up for June 1. Um, and the other question was about international reporting. So there's ways to go abroad. Um, business journalism is sort of the obvious way to go abroad, but that's we're talking like a like a full time job or a an internship, starting out as an intern and then getting hired. There are also students who just want to uh, be foreign correspondents in just some interesting part of the world that they have experience in or language skills in. And there are there are a couple of scholarship programs that our students sort of dominate y- year after year, like the Overseas Press Club. That is a, a competition that gives gives a student a little bit of money to um, get going. Uh, it's a small amount of money, but it's it's like a nice vote of confidence, and that's an that's a competition that our that our students um, have sort of done really well in competing for every every year so does that answer your question yeah I was just say everything helps I lived in Hong Kong for three years so I hope that that experience in some way would be helpful as far as that aspect of it's definitely helpful okay. if you want to go back to Hong Kong and be a business reporter if you want to be an arts and culture reporter it's going to be a little tough no because I know my friend works for South China Morning Post and right. she started off as a sub editor and she, it took a while, but she finally, now she's a full on um, reporter, so. We like South China Morning yeah. Post. So you have a relationship with them? We do. Great, good to hear it, thank <laughs> you. Thanks. Uh, so it was mentioned earlier, there are about 10 students in the data journalism program and about 14 in the journalism computer science dual degree. Uh, what does the dual degree teach that the data journalism program doesn't? Well, so the data journalism program seems, to, it, the people who apply to the data journalism program are uh, typically sort of, you know, um, liberal arts grads from college who really just want to learn data in the service of most most commonly um, sort of investigative and just deepening your your reporting with with um, with data. Is that a fair fair description? And and the computer science program is seriously heavy duty. A whole year up up at this at the engineering school, so you have to get admitted to the engineering school, which which means that you're probably going to it would benefit you if you had more of a math and science or engineering background to get into that school. So it's a different sort of um, phenotype. <laughs> Person, you know, you're learning. You're learning um, tools. You're learning how to build, how to uh, program, and you have much, more, much more high-level, more sophisticated computer science tools. 
and the jobs that you get are different. Um, that we're seeing students get in the comp sci dual degree program get more pro product manager jobs, jobs that I actually aren't, e I don't even know what they mean that, that much. We're still sort of learning, um, but they're more sort of on the techie side, um, building, building tools and for, for newsrooms to use. Thank you. Um, so I'm really interested in like long form writing and I was wondering um, how many of your graduates have ended up at places like the New Yorker at the Atlantic? Uh, those are really tough nuts to crack, obviously. And then the New York Times just changed its internship program. They eliminated their summer internship program. You can Google it. And they are now launching a one-year fellowship program. That's a, a complete game changer. And we're going to hear a lot more about it when they come visit us in a couple weeks to tell us, you know, where they're going to put these fellows. But out of last year's class, you know, we can never anticipate who they're going to choose. They chose a, um, the New York Times chose a, an MA science student from Iceland with 10 years of filmmaking experience. And they put him on the climate desk and, you know, he was doing sort of, you know, videos on, on climate change. And, and that's it. They didn't, they didn't choose one of our, our writers, our reporters last year, but the year before they did. I would say like one person gets chosen for the New York Times or two. And then, uh, you know, this prosecutor going to the Washington Post, which we did not see coming, um, but she's doing an amazing job. And the Atlantic also takes, you know, that's a one year fellowship and it's yeah. really prestigious and a lot of people apply and they ask you for your SAT scores on the application, whatever. Um, and, and so they chose like one person out of the class. Thank you. But that isn't it. I mean, there's so many long form um, vehicles. There's just so many. I mean, Marshall Project, The Intercept, um, you know, there's just so, there's a, a very broad a range of companies that allow, that, that do long form, including the alt weeklies. Are you familiar with alt weeklies? This is like the Village Voice, which used to exist, no longer does. The Phoenix New Times, where those students won the Polk Award, is an alt weekly. An alt weekly is a sort of a long form training kind of job where you're expected to crank out maybe 10 cover stories, and they're all 5,000 words per year. So you quickly get tons of long form investigative training and you're taught to write with voice and newspapers are appreciative of that, that kind of training. Um, in your job performance distribution chart, you showed that mostly um, most jobs are found in digital versus like I would say newspaper or magazines. Do you think that in respects to the foundation of a journalist, like what skills should one bone up and to actually get those careers? Well, there's two charts to pay attention to. Um, it, okay, this is, this is the one you're referring to. Uh, no, the other one. This uh, one? Yes. So the takeaway is most of our students get jobs doing reporting. And that is the, that is the focus of the journalism school, teaching you how to be a better reporter. Um, sending you out into neighborhoods, teaching you how to gather documents, teaching you how to file a FOIA and get officials to talk to you, and learning what, what um, materials are, public information, and, and what, what other stuff you can get to write stories. So that's the reporting, and most of our students do that. And also writing on deadline is really important in your first job after J school. I don't care how many years of experience you've had coming into J school. Your first job or two, if, you, if you're going to go to the Wall Street Journal, they're going to want you to be really fast on deadline. And you can't say to them, I only want to do long form. They're not interested. You're filling in for people on vacation. You have to sort of help them put out the paper. So um, you're learning deadline skills and reporting skills. And the second most common job duty that our students got was video and audio production. And so there's classes you know, for that. Um, what this juxtapose that information against this information and you see that it doesn't really matter what the platform is most students are still going to be reporters okay. does that answer your question yes. okay okay thank you so much for your time good luck with your decision You can come up in. Thanks. 
and back to Christine Souders. Thanks very much, Gina. Just in case anybody gets confused. <laughs> okay, I am going to talk quickly about the admission process, um, the application process, what it is that we're looking for, um, for in our different types of students, and then Taryn Almanzar will come and finish by talking about financial aid and scholarships, and we will be happy to take questions. I know there are questions. I also have a full list of questions that I've taken from your colleagues who are on the um, chat, and I have assured them that I will answer their questions as well. So let's talk about the admission process. You've decided that you are going to apply. What do you do? You go to the web link on the website, it says apply, um, and click on it. You create an application, um, and it's basically just like every other admissions application that you have created um, at an American school, whether undergraduate or graduate. We ask you to upload a number of documents. Um, I'll run through those in a second. But what we're looking for is we're looking for you to give us a picture of who you are and why you want to be a journalist um, and why you want to come to Columbia Journalism School to be, a, to, to be trained as a journalist. Um, and we ask that because there are a lot of good journalism schools in the United States. Um, and we have somewhat different focuses. We also have differing times to degree. And so we're interested in finding out who the students are who we think will be the best fit here at Columbia Journalism School. So whether you're applying to a Master of Science program, Master of Arts, doctoral program, um, we're going to be looking to see that you've taken a good look at the website. You might have come and talked with us, joined us for an information session, but really done your homework, your reporting um, on us. And then you're also going to give us evidence of your reporting on you. So think about the application in that way. It's, there's going to be an arc that you're going to create for us. And each piece of the application is going to be a part of that story. So you'll have a resume that you'll submit. That'll give us a certain type of information. You'll also submit essays. Generally, you'll submit an autobiographical essay. You'll also submit a journalism essay where you'll address why you want to be a journalist, what you would like to do or what you imagine doing as a journalist, and why Columbia Journalism School. If you have selected one of the specializations, either within the MS or the MA, you'll do a third essay, which is a specialization essay. If you've applied for the data journalism program, you'll do a third essay, which is going to be about your interest in and your understanding of data journalism. If you're in the doctoral program, you're going to use a more academic type of um, essay because we're also going to then be interested in your academic and research interests. So we've got resume, we've got essays, transcripts. We need transcripts from every single university that you ever attended. If you went for a semester and then transferred, we still need the transcripts from both universities. Um, so every single university that you ever attended, that's what we're looking for. International students who have attended universities where English is not the language of instruction. If your transcript is in another language, we also will need to have a translation, a verbatim translation of the transcript. So that gives us information about your academic record. We're also looking for writing samples. 
Um, for people who are applying to the MS and the MA, we're looking for writing samples that give us evidence of your ability to do reporting and, if possible, journalistic style writing. We understand that there are plenty of people who have not had the opportunity to do journalistic style writing. If you don't have that, you don't have it. Um, but we're looking for three samples. For the MS program, they can be writing samples, they can be audio, they can be video. So there are a number of possibilities there. If you're going to submit audio or video samples, we also want the script that's behind it. Um, if you're giving us an audio or a video sample that is in another language, we need the translation of it as well. And you'll want to have subtitles for the translation. Um, for students who, for whom English is not your first language, we require either the IELTS or the TOEFL unless you have completed all four years of your university, your first university degree, so your bachelor's degree, all four years at a university where English is the medium of instruction for every single course unless you were doing like me and majoring in French. Did I leave anything? Letters of reference. Letters of reference. We require three letters of reference, no matter which program you're applying to. What are we looking for there? We're looking for letters from people who have supervised your work. So who is that? professors who have supervised your work and given you a grade in a classroom setting, or supervisors, work supervisors, the people who write your performance evaluation, unless you don't want to tell them that you're thinking about leaving next year. Um, but we're really looking for people who can comment about the kind of work that you do, who can comment about your interest in journalism, um, and who can also make some comments about their opinion of your ability to succeed in a very intensive, fast-paced graduate journalism program. So that is what we're looking for in applications. Who are we looking for in students? For the MS programs, we are looking for people who write well, you don't have to be an absolutely terrific writer. One of the reasons that you want to come to journalism school is to learn to be a better writer. That's what we'll teach you here. But we're looking for good writing skills to begin with. We're looking for other qualities that we think make a good journalist. So things like curiosity, persistence, determination. We're looking for people who want to tell stories. Storytelling in addition to reporting, storytelling is at the core of what a journalist does. You're telling a story, and you want to be able to tell it in a way that grabs attention and holds the reader or the listener um, or the person who's watching. But you want to learn how to do that um, so that it holds people's attention. And you want to love journalism. We're looking for people who want to be journalists. So what if you haven't made a decision yet about whether you want to be a journalist? That is something you want to resolve before you apply to graduate school. And I say that because graduate school takes a lot of time. You will spend inordinate amounts of time, including sleepless nights, getting through graduate school. It also costs a lot of money. And before you take the time, and assume the costs that you'll incur, you want to be sure that it's absolutely what you want to do. So if you're debating right now between maybe media, maybe journalism, maybe strategic communications, maybe public relations, sort that out before you apply to graduate school. Find an internship, do a couple of things just to make sure that journalism school is what you want, because we're looking for focus. Okay, 
that was a very quick overview. I'm happy to take questions, and if you can go up to the microphone so that we'll have it for the recordings, and those of you on the live stream, I have your questions right here also. Go ahead, please. Hi, uh, just really quick. The transcripts have to be official, like sealed documents, or we can just upload PDFs of the unofficial? You can upload a copy of the unofficial transcript. Okay, yeah. thank you. When you guys are looking at the um, clips that we've submitted, are you are there any themes that are more endearing than others more, that are more attractive? Um, like maybe films that affirm community or health, or is there anything in particular that you guys are looking for? Something that's well put together, um, something where we can see evidence of the reporting that you had to do, because we have two documentary programs here at Columbia. We've got one in the journalism program that focuses on, it really focuses on journalism, and there's one right across the way, right across College Walk at the School of the Arts that really focuses on sort of more a creative kind of documentary film work. So if you're submitting for us, we're going to be looking for some evidence of journalistic style documentary yes. video. Yeah. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Uh, hi, correct me if I'm wrong, but is there a uh, writing test of some ah, kind after the yes. application is submitted? Yes. Yeah. Um, I guess my question about the writing test is just um, from the perspective of the admissions committee, what is the writing test sort of conveying to you about an applicant that um, you're not getting from clips or from essays? Great question. The writing test is um, something that's necessary for all of the Master of Science applications. It is not required for the MA. Let me just caution you, don't make the mistake of applying to the MA program just because you don't want to take the writing test. <laughs> because I see you and I know who you are. <laughs> Look at the programs and apply to the program that is best going to suit your needs. Look at yourself, look at your skills, and say to yourself, which of these programs is going to give me what I don't have and what I actually need? So back to the writing test. The writing test is a 90-minute writing test. Um, it is divided into three 30-minute sections. You take it online. You can take it anywhere in the world. You can take it at any time. When you submit the application, we give you the information. Um, and actually, are we going to try to give that out even earlier this year? Yeah, we're aiming to be able to allow you to complete it as a part of the application so that um, we'll be able to send you the test information perhaps even before you submit your application. It's, you know, it focuses on current events. Um, there are no gotcha questions, or at least I don't think that they're gotcha questions. Each section gives you a selection of questions. You can choose the one to respond to that you feel most comfortable. The questions are short answer questions, longer form, and maybe a little bit longer form. Why? What we're looking for, you know, you've written all those essays for us, you've given us writing samples, audio, video samples. We're also looking to see what happens when you sit down and just bang out some answers as you would be required to do at any news organization. So that we're getting three examples of the type of writing that you do. So that's what it is. Um, I don't think it's anything to be scared of, um, but of course I don't have to take it. <laughs> but nonetheless, it's just, you know, it's the kind of thing, think about it as it's, you know, it's not going to be any harder than any test you ever took in undergraduate school. And you're going to have a choice of the questions. They're based on current events. You'll see that they will be questions that might pertain to local news, national news in whatever country that you live in, local news again in whatever country you live in. Um, they might be about people. If you are looking on the internet, there's a very old example of the test on the internet that 
asks you who the nine Supreme Court justices are and gives you a map and says identify the countries around Iran. I don't think that test has been given since 2003. Ignore it. <laughs> this is solely a writing test. Um, and there's really nothing you can do to prepare for it either. Sure. So Thank you. You're welcome. I have two quick questions. Sure. Um, one, for the Stabile investigative specialization, when you apply, are you considered for both the general MS program and the specialization? Yes. You would be considered first for Stabile, okay. which you've applied for. And if, because we only take 15 people for Stabile, so if we are not going to take you but feel that you would have a very strong application for the um, multimedia MS program, yes, we would also consider you for that. Unless you tell us, don't do it. Okay, and then for clips, so say you have clips from like a publication, I correct me if I'm wrong, but you want them in PDF format, yeah? That would be the best, and you can also give us the link to them. Okay, cool, yeah. thank you. Hi. Oop. I'll pick it up later. Just a couple quick things. Sure. Uh, no, I don't think anybody really talked about scholarships. What kind We're going to get there. Okay. I just want to make sure. I'll save that for later. But I saw, I was reading that you have some international programs so you can study at schools overseas. Nobody's really discussed that. I was wondering how that works as far as the application process and what that entails. Because, you sure. know, I've lived, I'm the kind of guy that will go anywhere I like traveling. Sure. So I'd be interested in sure. those. Sure. Right now we have a program with Sciences Po, with the journalism school at Sciences Po in Paris. Um, students apply to that program by December 1st of their first semester here at Columbia. It can also be that they're at Sciences Po and they're applying to do their second year of the journalism program here at Columbia. So it goes both ways. Um, you do need to speak, read, and write French um, for that program. It allows you to take courses at the Sciences Po Journalism School that you were not able to take here. Um, you also do a two-semester internship, normally at um, a French-speaking news organization. One of the reasons that you need to be able to speak French so you can go out and do your news reporting and then you're writing in French. But what it gives you is a great opportunity um, to understand news reporting from a different perspective in another country. Um, yeah, because I saw there was one for a university in South Africa. Would that be English uh, proficient that one, acceptable? That one is in English. Um, that one is kind of on hold right now. Okay. The way that would work is our program finishes in May. The program at WITS um, in Johannesburg at the University of Witwatersrand, um, that program starts in January uh, because the, the university is on a southern hem hemisphere academic cycle. So they, their programs start in January instead of September. So. This sounds exciting. I'm already You in. can also <laughs> apply to that program independently okay. as well. Yeah. All right, thank you. Sure. Hello again. Hello again. Um, I have a question about what type of recommendation letter holds more weight in admissions. Is it a recommendation letter from a mentor or supervisor that knows you really well, known you for years, or an alumni recommendation letter from someone who knows you but not quite as well? Did the alum supervise your work? Yes. Either of those would be perfectly acceptable. Um, the fact that the person is an alum doesn't necessarily change things. Mm -hmm. um, gotcha. You have you need three, so <laughs> you can choose that. You can choose both of them. And one last sure. question: Would you um, suggest that we submit not? three of the same types of samples, like three video, three audio, three writing samples, should we mix it up? You should be sure to submit at least one writing sample yes. if you are a video or an audio person, um, because writing is important. Mm -hmm. 
And then you could submit a video clip. You could submit an audio clip. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, let me just take a quick look at, and then I'll come back to you, at some of these questions here to make sure that we've covered them. What is the documentary application deadline? Application deadlines in general, let me just mention those. December 16th for all of the MS programs, which includes the documentary program, um, for the doctoral program also. The MA program application deadline is January 9th. The dual degree program with computer science, January 15th. The dual degree program with computer science, that application you get to through the engineering school website. But you can click through to it directly from our website as well. Um, so that um, is for deadlines. Um, let me see here. If you want to visit the school, how do you do that? Email the admissions office. Let us know when you're planning to be here. We can arrange for you to sit in on some classes, meet students. There are also, if you look in the events section of the website, you'll also see evening lectures. Um, if you go to the YouTube section of the website, you'll also see prior events that have been live streamed prior lectures um, by journalists that have been live streamed. So there are a lot of, of possibilities there. But if you are coming in person, just get in touch with us. Give us about a, a week um, lead time, and we can help you organize your visit. Um, let's see. Somebody had a question about if your TOEFL score or your IELTS score is slightly below what we require. We require a 114 on the TOEFL or an 8.0 on the IELTS. If it's slightly below, absolutely, go ahead and apply. If it's 100 or below, then you need to work on your English more before you apply. If you have any question whatsoever, get in touch with the admissions office, send your scores to us, tell us which program you're applying to, and we'll give you, we'll give you um, some analysis about what we think you should do. Um, what else do we have here? Somebody asked if documentary was a specialization within the MS program. Yes, it is. Um, Kevin, who is up in Ithaca, wants to know how best to prepare. Kevin's still in undergraduate school. Students who are in undergraduate school, we get people who come to us from all different majors. We don't care what your undergraduate major was. Um, do your best. It's interesting for us if you have done some work for a school news organization, whether it's the newspaper, the radio station, um, the school broadcast station whether, you know, if you've had some internships, those are things that you can do to prepare. I also now recommend, because journalism seems to be moving in this direction, if you have time in your schedule, take a computer programming course. It's going to help you no matter what you do professionally. And take a statistics course um, so that you have a little bit of expertise in working with data, even if that's not what you want to do. Um, and I think that's about it, and we're really running short on time. I'm going to stop right now and pass the mic to my colleague, Taryn Almanzar, who's going to finish by talking about finance. Oh, I beg your pardon. I forgot you were there. Sorry. Go ahead. Really quick, as far as um, letters of reference, would it be strange to get two letters of reference from two different people at the same news outlet? that both supervise your work? Would it be That's better? absolutely fine. That's fine, okay. Yeah, yeah, and not unusual, yeah. So Taryn is gonna talk about um, financial aid, financial planning, and scholarships. Thank you all. Okay, I know we are um, over our time. Uh, so I'm going to make this as um, quickly as possible. 
I'll start off with this. I know it's been a long day, so, and I know that people usually remember the first two things you say and the last two things. So I'll start off by saying, start your planning now. Start looking at the cost of attendance, look at the tuition and fees, um, look what the living expenses are in New York. New York City is one of the most expensive cities in the world, and you have to live, and you will not be able to work if you're attending the program full time. So start looking into that now, even as you're putting together your application. The second thing that I will say, please apply for scholarship funding. Admissions is need blind. Okay, two things, walk away from here. Start your financial planning now. Admissions is need blind. What that means is that we will not look at your scholarship aid application to determine if you are going to be admitted into the school or not. That's one of the biggest roadblocks um, that people usually um, have in their minds that we will be looking at the scholarship aid application in order to determine um, if you're going to be admitted or not. So with that said, there are three types of finances um, or options, if you will, that you will have as a student, whether you come here to the J School or any other place. It's scholarship, student loans, and personal resources. Under scholarship, you're going to have two, op two main categories, if you will. There is private organizations outside scholarships, as we call them, and we start you off with the list. These are independent organizations that are offering funds to students. Search for them now. Look at what their application requirements are. It ranges from your demographic to your interest. As you're searching for them, think of yourself as a pie that's made up of many different um, things. and. Um, look for it that way. It's not a waste of time. I've seen checks as small as 200 and as big as $40,000 come across my desk. So start the search now. Within that, you have the J School Scholarship. Please apply for it. We cannot consider you for scholarship funding unless you submit the application. The application will be available beginning of December and it will have a February 1st deadline. Again, please submit the application. It's pretty straightforward. I know that as soon as we start mentioning finances and all of that, people get tensed up. I promise you, all of the things that we're asking in that scholarship aid app, you know about it. I'll tell you a little bit what it is. Demographics, what are your interests in reporting? There is a section that you're gonna type in your bio, and then there is another section that's going to ask about um, particular interest that you may have and you have to type in a short essays for it. And then of course we're going to be asking about uh, savings, um, any work income, but again it's all information that you have um, and that you should be able to provide. I should mention that for those of you who are in undergrad um, school or you're independent, we are not looking at your parents' financial information, it's just yours. So J School Scholarship ADAP will be available in December, February 1st deadline. And please hit the submit button. <laughs> I just can't emphasize that enough. Um, some applicants start the application and they finish it, but they don't hit that submit button. And then they call us and we're like, oh my god, you didn't hit submit. So we couldn't um, consider you for it. Scholarship funding ranges anywhere from $5,000 to about $96,000, with the median being about 35000 or so, which is wonderful, which is great, but you still need to cover the rest of your cost of attendance. And it, the cost of attendance, remember, includes tuition and fees and your living expenses. Have I said living expenses enough? Yes. <laughs> so keep that in mind. So the other category, student loans. Student loans are a reality, unfortunately. Um, as you've seen in the news and probably in your own personal life, students are borrowing. Um, if you are a U.S. citizen or permanent resident, the federal government, Department of Education, offers $20,500 guaranteed as long as you're net in default of a prior student loan and your overall student loan debt, it's not over $138,000. They also offer the Graduate PLUS loan, and you can borrow up to your cost of attendance. What that means is that you can borrow for tuition and fees plus living expenses. I'm just giving you a very um, general, broad overview of your options. If you go to our website, we will, it will have a lot more details about interest rate, um, which is fixed, 
um, eligibility requirements, which basically covers what I've just said, um, and the fact that you need to fill out the free application for federal student aid. There's also the option of private educational loans, which are offered by private lenders. Um, look into that. Uh, if you are an international student, you will probably need a US citizen to act as a co-signer. And they also allow you to borrow up to the cost of attendance, which includes tuition and fees and living expenses. And finally, your own personal resources. Tuition, um, well, the university bill, I should say, it's due once every semester. But for the fall and spring, you have the option of breaking up or um, segregating, I should say, whatever it is that you can pay out of your own pocket into 10 monthly payments. So let's say after scholarship, after student loans, you're going to say, I can pay $5,000 out of my own savings accounts or whatever it is that you have coming in. That means that every month you pay $500. And that is really helpful to our students to know about the payment plan because it allows you to plan on a monthly basis. And instead of having um, a uh, chunk of amount due in September and the other one in January, you're able to split it up. They don't look into your credit history or anything like that. There is a small fee that is $45 for the fall and spring for both semesters. So I've bombarded you with a lot of information, um, but I would like to open it up now for a few questions. Um, and uh, yeah, feel free to ask. Um, potentially two questions, depending on the answer sure. for the first. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about, in terms of the scholarship from Columbia, how much uh, like need-based versus merit-based? Excellent question. So we don't have need-based, merit-based, or anything like that. All of our scholarship funding comes in from donations that are made to the school. Um, so in order to be eligible for scholarship aid, first you have to meet the scholarship eligibility requirements demonstrate financial need um, based on the scholarship aid application documents, free application for federal student aid, and academic merit um, as determined by the admissions committee. So it's all three of those eligibility requirements that the student must meet or the applicant must meet in order for us to award funding. So there's not a segregated, I know a lot of schools says we have X amount that we can award for need-based, X amount for academic merit. That's that's not the methodology for us. Um, I guess kind of based off of that, and I might not have understood, but for the first part of the scholarship application, it sounded a little bit more like personal. Mm -hmm. uh, or is the information that you're taking about applicants also based on the application that you're submitting to the admissions committee? Very rarely, we will look at the admissions application when allocating funds because, again, in order for us to give you or award scholarship funding, you need that scholarship aid. So we were basing it off what you're providing on the scholarship aid application. That's why there is a section there that's asking for your bio. And um, in the first section, you're, there's going to be a checkbox and that is going to say, are you interested in golf? Are you interested in broadcast and all of that? So we will be basing that um, in order to allocate the funds. Mm -hmm. And I would also just say, in addition to that, I think the times that we go back to the application are when we're looking, you know, we have some funds that have very, very specific requirements. So for instance, that it be an international student who wants to go into print business reporting or something like that. And then we might just go back to that person's resume to make sure that that person is truly interested in print business reporting. And just to clarify, I guess we would all qualify for the graduate loan from the federal government. And you said that that can be up to the cost of tuition and living expenses. How mm -hmm. does that, I'm just curious, is like, how do you determine that? Or is there, as far as living expenses goes, I didn't even know you could do that. Yes, for the living expenses, um, we estimate what a student will need based on um, what a person will spend here in New York in terms of rent, uh, utility, food, um, transportation, we take all of that into account. If you go to our cost of attendance section on the website, it'll each program has its own, 
and you're going to see, but usually for the 10 month uh, program, where you begin in August and you end in May, we're estimating that you're going to need about $30,000 or so oh, okay. for living. So the school determines that number and then we would basically request that as a loan. Exactly. Okay, because yes. I thought it would just be, oh, I'm gonna- Oh, people, no, no, no. I'm, okay, good. <laughs> no, All no, right. no, no, good question. All right, thank mm -hmm. you. You're welcome. One more. Sure, um, sure. Mm -hmm. If you're doing the two-year MS program, uh, are you guaranteed the same amount scholarship for both years? We try to maintain the same amount. You have to reapply the second year, but nine times out of 10, we will honor that. Any other questions? We have time for one or two more. Can you, just so that the live streamers can hear you. <laughs> Thank you. So the application uh, for the scholarship becomes available separately from the actual application yes. itself? Yes. Okay, so yes. it's not like I'm checking off a box in the application portal. You can check off the box, but even, um, even with that, you still need to submit the scholarship aid application. Okay, and, and that, mm -hmm. sorry, that will become available on the website itself or I'll get an email saying that? Yes, okay. yes and yes, Thank so you. both, <laughs> yes. We will be sending that out um, and saying it's available, submitted, February 1st is the deadline, um, and, and yes, we'll be reminding everyone. Any other questions? No? Okay, so with that, Thank you so much for having you spend your Saturday morning and part of your afternoon. And hopefully I'll see you here all as students so we can talk about when you came in and when you saw me on live stream. Thank you. <laughs>